Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Enjoy the Book of Life. With me today is John Biorley. Now, uh, my family and the Biorley family have known each other for a long time. Our parents have known, or my father has known uh, John Biorley well before I was born and uh, have benefited greatly from knowing uh, brother uh, Biorley, sitting under his teaching and just sitting around his dinner table, uh, listening with him and his wife and, and growing up uh, alongside his son. So I'm very uh, pleased and excited to let you uh, share in some of that wisdom that I've gotten to benefit from uh, all through my life. So brother John Biorley, you have had quite the background with books. Yes. And you're quite familiar with books. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit in our resource review today about books. Could you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, when I was uh, a new believer, I was encouraged to read certain devotional commentaries, like uh, Harry Arnside's commentaries, which were largely notes from his sermons. I, th I think I read almost all of his books. And then other, other books from the same, uh, same vein, like Edward Dennett's book on Exodus or uh, the books of, of uh, uh, G.C. Willis, who's a missionary in China. And he wrote these delightful little books about Old Testament passages. He wrote a book about Jonah, a book about the law of the leper from uh, the book of Leviticus. Uh, and, and so the type of books that I initially read were very devotional, immediately applicable, practical types of studies. And the thing I came to see by studying these books was the devotional quality of the Word of God itself, that the, the Bible is, is written in a commonplace way. There are technical places in the word which are get very minute and, and certainly very difficult, but a lot of the word of God is biographical, uh, historical, some autobiographical, like the book of Nehemiah, but a lot of it uh, has bite-sized stories where you'll have immediate applications. And as if you take seriously the statement that the Lord that you have about the Lord's teaching in uh, the ending of Luke's gospel, as he was walking with the two on the road to Emmaus, it says, "In beginning in Moses and in all the prophets, he spoke unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself." So that in all of the scriptures we have teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and and so that means that there is definitely this devotional aspect to the Word of God. And I, I came to really feel sorry for people who spend all their time on technical commentaries. I use technical commentaries. Uh, I use dictionaries, encyclopedias, and uh, uh, reference materials. I find it really helpful. But I find it sad when people are reading commentaries which don't have that devotional aspect to them and in which they're they're not being caused to delight in the word of god and to enjoy the study of the word of god some some commentaries frankly are withering they're dry uh, and there's skeletons and so, without the skeletons without the meat <laughs> skeletons without the meat <laughs> yeah and and uh and so one, once I was asked to speak about on the topic of prayer at one of the workers' conferences, the thing I noticed is that the very best Bible teachers were men of prayer, and it, it was notable about them, their prayer life, and so in their biographies. But you'll have other men who are not really spiritual men but they have all the tools of good Bible study at their disposal. They know the original languages. Uh, they, they have all the time that they could ever crave 
to spend in their studies looking into the word. And, and uh, they, uh, they've forgotten more about the, the technical side of the word of God than I will ever learn. And yet for all of that, they can't see the most basic doctrine. They don't even believe in the virgin birth. And so it's possible to read the Bible in a technical sort of way and totally miss the message, yeah. Yeah. which is absolutely sad. So in order to really know the word of God, you have to have a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in reading the word, be looking for revelation and thoughts about the Lord Jesus Christ as you go into the word. Um, so I, so I think an example of that might be, no, maybe we'll talk about this later, but. So, but, so you, yeah. you, you got that good kind of foundation with those early recommendations. Who, who is recommending those first, that first set of books that you were reading? There was a man in Fargo, North Dakota. I was, I was um, saved living in a place called Valley City, North Dakota, and 60 miles away, there was a little assembly that started up, and a man who was working at a bank there and had some resources, he bought stocks of books from trusted uh, publishers, and he started supplying all of the young men in the area with good libraries. And, and so he would promote different books that he thought were very helpful. And a lot of them were old books which had actually been written in the 1800s or early part of the 1900s. And uh, they're, they're currently in print, they were available. And uh, his name was John DeBille, he's a very dear guy. And he, he made everything available either at cost or he would give them away. He was a great proponent of reading good books. And, and, I, and by the way, I'm not against uh, reading commentaries or, or reading reference material because uh, after all, when the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, here he was a high level, probably an economist we'd say, the treasurer, uh, a cabinet member in the queen of Ethiopia, and he was riding along in his chariot, leaving from Jerusalem. And he had on his lap, it seems, the scroll of Isaiah. And this must have been, in those days, a hugely expensive thing to own, but he had one. And as he was there pondering it, Philip came alongside the chariot. Now, Philip, we don't know that he was a high level guy at all. He was probably a very common man, but a man who knew God and knew the word of God. And as he came alongside the chariot, he peered in side and he said to, the, to this uh, treasurer of the kingdom of Ethiopia, he said, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch responded, how can I unless some man should guide me. And, and with that, Philip climbed into the chariot, sat down beside him and explained to him the connectedness of Isaiah 53 with the prophecies of, which would later be fulfilled about the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrificial work. Well, all of us as we're reading through the word, we we, uh, we pray, we say, Lord, help me to understand. We look up the references, we, we check cross-references, we read other translations to see if there's, there's some difference in the way things are translated, maybe giving us a clue to something we should look up as far as a word study. We, we do different things, but after it's all said and done, you say, I need some help here. And so, and so God is given to the church teachers. And just as uh, in our churches, we have certain people who get up on Sunday and they teach the Word of God. Sometimes they've been wonderful and great teachers, but they're no longer with us, but they have left us their books. Okay. And so we can get those books in our library and use them. There's nothing wrong with using study books, although 
you ought to, first of all, spend your time in the Word of God itself and compare the translations. Uh, I use the New King James in my personal study. I, I have certain reasons why I like that translation. It's not a perfect translation, but uh, I, 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 I've been pretty happy with it. And, but I, I read a lot of the different translations. But after that's all said and done, I like to consult with the commentaries. And a couple of commentaries that I think are really delightful in this vein are those written by, I'll just mention this because I think this is helpful. Uh, there's this man, Harold Sinjin, and he has a two volume uh, set of his collected writings. He had a, a commentary in the Gospel of Mark and different other portions of the word that he wrote in. But he would be a great example of somebody who had a profound knowledge of the Word of God. He was an Englishman, a contemporary with people like W.E. Vine. He knew a lot of outstanding Christians. He himself was a missionary. He uh, went to Brazil and other areas in South America, labored. And his, he is the father of um, a Patricia St. John, who was the, the uh, children's writer. She wrote Treasures in the Snow okay. and other good children's books. And, and Harold St. John, uh, he mentored a lot of outstanding Bible students. One of them was F.F. F. Bruce. F.F. Wow. F. Bruce is known in our generation. He's gone now, but, but a tremendous uh, uh, Bible student. And F.F. F. Bruce wrote this. We younger men referred to him, talking about uh, Harold St. John. We referred to him as the maestro, but not to his face, as he would have strongly depreciated any attempt to place him on a higher level than those who delighted to sit at his feet. For detailed acquaintance with the text of scripture, he had few equals. Well, the home director of the China Inland Mission said that he had a better knowledge of the word of God than anyone else in Britain, talking about uh, St. John. Yeah, well. yeah, and there's a story that you often hear, and it's been attributed to different preachers, but actually did happen to, it was actually did happen to a preacher, and that preacher was Harold St. John, and the story goes like this, he was, he had gotten done preaching a message, he was leaving the building, and a lady walked up to him and said, oh, Mr. St. John, I would give the world to know the word of God the way you do. To which Harold St. John responded, and that is exactly what it cost. Wow. <laughs> Harold St. John, but he, but he has delightful teaching, informative, uh, studied, accurate. We were told, I think it was T. Ernest Wilson in his, uh, lectures when he'd come through he was a good bible student too and and uh former missionary and a lot of the really good bible students i've found have been the preachers and the missionaries they've had to take the word of god and break it down and especially these who have had to introduce it into another language they had to think it through hmm. to, to get at the morrow of what is really being said and and so uh uh, David Boyd Long, we, I often heard him. He was a guy who, when he would preach, David Long, he would, he would give such clear outlines that decades later, I can recite the entire sermon. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's remarkable. Very profitable things. So, uh, but Tiernus Wilson, he would say the three rules of, of good Bible study are accuracy, Accuracy, accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but all these men, they they depreciated what I would call that dry, sterile, withering intellect, pseudo intellectual type of approach to the Word of God, a pretended intellectualism. When you read the Word of God for itself, there. Is such a vitality to it and and then to go away 
and and write sterile things just is missing the whole spirit of everything you've read. I mean, yeah. have we been have we been paying attention to what we've been reading? Right. Yeah. So you've got the, the uh, this, these good examples, these authors, yeah. and uh, you you've read your fair share of books. Um, how how do you evaluate like those books early on? Those were recommended to you, and, yeah. and they were they were good recommendations. They set you off on the right path. But let's say you you do get a recommendation, you're not sure about it, or if you just get your hands on a book, how can I evaluate a book to see, is this worth my time? Because there are so many books out there and we, yeah. we don't want to spend hours on a book that isn't going to be beneficial, profitable. So how would yeah. you evaluate a book to see, is this worth my time reading? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, uh, in Philippians chapter four, Paul talks about our thinking habits, which what we should fill our minds with. And he talks about uh, things which are lovely, uh, things which are pure. And he has a whole list of things. But one of the things that he mentions is whatsoever is of good report. Think on these things, good report. And I, I feel sad for people who wander into a bookstore and just in a lazy kind of curiosity, pull a book off the shelf, buy it and go home and read it. But without any recommendation, especially without a recommendation from a godly spiritual person. And years ago, an old brother, he, he pointed out that verse to me, uh, whoever walks with wise men shall be wise but a companion of fools should be destroyed. And, and I asked him, what does it mean to walk with wise men? And he, he commented, if when you walk with somebody, you have to keep pace with them. So if I'm gonna walk with a wise man, I, I walk alongside of them. I walk where they're walking. It's like I'm saying, what, who are his friends? What kind of people does he choose? Where does he go? How does he spend his time? What books does he read? And, and if I want to be wise, I'm going to be asking those questions. So if you know somebody who is really spiritual and godly, you should be asking them. You should say, what kind of books do you appreciate and enjoy? That's, that's, that is a very important thing. Yeah. So I don't, I'm very picky about the books that I read. For instance, I'll listen to books, uh, audio books that I get from the library. The great majority of the books available to a public library are trash. It's amazing. I can't believe that people are actually reading these things or listening to them. It's just astounding to me. But I know what I want. Yeah. And so I and I found you know, John Bunyan's works, I all kinds of really, really profitable and helpful things through the public library. I, I got Hudson Taylor's biography through the public library, the audio book. Wow. Yeah, great things. A lot of one. Right now, I'm listening to a booklet by C.H. Spurgeon. Hmm. So, so whatever is of good report, think on these things. Men and women who are who are known to be truly spiritual, godly people, get acquainted with them. And a lot of them, you uh, they're not around but you can find their books. You can read about them, that kind of thing. So read books which are recommended. I can't emphasize that enough. When I pick up a book, then one of the things that I do is I'll, I'll open up to the table of contents and I'll see, well, this is what it's supposed to be about. And I'll look over the table of contents and then I will open it up to the back of the book where the index is or the bibliography, and, and usually, well, a good book is going to have a good index. I know there are, there are certain books, cheaply printed books, where they don't even include an index. And I don't, I don't understand that, because for a publisher, it just takes a couple of days with the software available to us to generate an index. Yep. It's not a big deal. It's, 
you, you, you go through the manuscript, you tag the different in points of interest or all the Bible verses in the, in the copy, and then you generate, after you get everything else done, you generate the index. So it's simple to do. So, uh, so good books have indexes, at least I'm saying professionally done books or well done books. <laughs> and and uh, so you, you look through the index and, and uh, uh, does it reference the Bible? It's amazing to me, so many of these books, which they'll blather on page after page and only a smattering of Bible references. So the author, it, now it may be that they're paraphrasing verses and referencing verses, but not actually quoting chapter and verse like we'd like to see it. So I'm not saying this is a, I'm not saying it's a hard rule, right. but usually when you don't see many Bible references in the index, that means that the person's not thinking biblically. He's not got his mind is not flowing in the text of scripture. And then uh, what kind and, of- And just, just one point with that. To, go ahead, just, David. Yeah, just one point with that. Um, I, I find one of the most helpful when they're the references in the text, it allows me to check what they're saying because they're saying, it has to do with this text. So I can go directly back to the text and see, do I agree with them? And if they leave those out, if they're just alluding to it, it's not as easy to check the author with the word of God. Very good, very good. And in the day in which we live, there's such a pervasive ignorance of the word of God. It's very easy for people to say, this is strong, this point that I'm making is strongly taught in this passage way over in the book of Genesis. And people are bowled over by it because they don't know their Bibles. And they're not checking up on these authors. They're not holding them accountable. And when you bring in the word of God, and if, and if you grow to know more and more about the word of God, well, then you'll know the wider story. So I, I, often, I often run upon that where, where people are making a point out of a passage, but it's really not the main point of the passage. Yep. Yeah, drawing an application. So, uh, so when you come to the bibliography, I've noticed in many books that I, I have, I've looked at where the people that they reference, that they've used to build their book are not the kind of people that we should be listening to. They'll have, folks who are not sound about basic doctrine. And uh, I remember one, not too long ago, I was reading a book about the fundamentalist movement. And this book had been often referenced to this book about the fundamentalist movement was considered a, a real authoritative book on the subject. And I was reading, I think the first edition that came out and, and uh, the author failed to mention James H. Brooks. Well, anyone who knows anything about the fundamentalist movement knows that James H. Brooks was a mentor to C.I. Schofield. James H. Brooks, who edited the magazine The Truth, which was that banner statement, come out from among you and be separate, saith the Lord. Come out from among them. And so uh, the, the whole spirit of the fundamentalist movement in America was uh, really founded by, in a way, uh, men like James H. Brooks. James H. Brooks could really be called the father of the fundamentalist movement. And C.I. Schofield and R.A. Torrey, who came in the generation that followed, were the two main pillars of the movement. But as far as this book was concerned, it's supposed to be explaining to us what the fundamentalist movement is. They, they gave short, they didn't even know who James H. Brooks was, didn't know who John Darby was. And Don, John Darby was the one who had been visiting James H. Brooks Church and had, had had such an influence on him, didn't even mention them. It's like they didn't exist. And I thought to myself, here is a book written by someone who is so out of sympathy with the subject that he's talking about, 
claiming to be an authority, but doesn't know anything about the subject matter because mm. he, he, he's never been among them. He doesn't understand them. So, so you, you run upon that. So, you know, look, look at the index, look at the bibliography and, and, and definitely read things which are recommended to you by people that you trust, people that are godly. Now, are there any signs that, or little red flags that pop up to you? Like if you start reading a book and then are there any red flags where you, it tells you it's time to stop reading this book? What, what would those red flags be that let, let's say it was recommended to you uh, or you're not as familiar with uh, who's in the bibliography. So you start reading it. And yep. then what, what are those things that tell you may, maybe this doesn't deserve my time? Uh, a, a, a verse that you could look to there would be over in um, First John chapter 2, right toward the end of the chapter, where you have uh, the, um, the statement, um, these things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him, from God, abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is truth and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. So he's talking there about things which are deceptive. There, there is, of course, a lot of deception going on. There always has, but in our generation, it's as if every major heresy of the past 2000 years is being brushed up and polished and dusted off and reintroduced and re uh, 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 yeah they're floating all these ideas all the time and and so we need to be established and grounded in what the truth of the word of god is and so here in first john he says that we have a safeguard and that is that we all of us if we know the lord we have a divine teacher, that is the Holy Spirit of God, who's called the anointing. Now, oil usually is, is, uh, is trans, transparent. You can see through it. But and you get it on yourself. You, if you anoint yourself with it, it has a way of getting right into your skin. And in the same way, when the Holy Spirit is working in us, it gets right into us, and in such a way that it's able to inform us. Is God, by his Holy Spirit, able to actually teach us what the truth of the Word of God is? That's the question. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Are, are we simply abandoned to our superior traditions in the church group that we happen to be with? or the clever scholarship of certain Bible colleges we subscribe to, or certain dramatic experiences we've had. Some groups are always emphasizing experience. Well, all of those things, tradition, scholarship, and experience all have their place, and they can reinforce our Christian experience and agree with the truth. But ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit which teaches us truth so that yeah. we can know truth. And in this case, he's saying that those basic fundamental things, which all Christians hold, all Christians know who God is. That's one of the things he talks about in 1 John. So he talks about who God is, who is Christ. Is, did Christ really come in the flesh? Did, did he become a real man? Did God come into the world as the son of God, becoming the son of man, and live out his life down here. And, and then there are other things, such as our personal sinfulness and Christ's payment to deal with our problem of sin. There are many doctrinal things which 
all Christians know to be true. Yep. And the only explanation for it is that all real Christians have the Holy Spirit in them, teaching them what the Word of God is saying. Mm -hmm. And so we have that dependence. And, and somebody pointed this out to me a long time ago, and I really appreciate it, is that no matter where you go around the world, you'll see Christians reading different Bibles from different languages, different Bible translations, same Bible, but in a different translation, and translated and from in different periods, and people in many different kinds of groups, and yet all of them, and it wouldn't matter if you're talking about Mennonites or Presbyterians or Anglicans or, or Lutherans or Baptists or Pentecostals or independent Bible churches. You've got all these real Christians, lovely Christians, all around the world, and all of them reading out of the same Bible and arriving at the same conclusions about fundamental doctrine that God is one, yet God is revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that God created everything, that God created it as good, but that sin entered in, and mankind has fallen, and that is the origin of sin, our fall, and it necessitated God sending his son, the Messiah, to come and make a payment on the cross where he literally died, literally was buried, and literally rose again. And interestingly, also in all of these different church uh, churches all around the world, they also all believe in the second coming of Christ. Now, they, they, they may fritter away on the edges and have different unique interpretations on certain details, but all around the world, believers, Christians, in all kinds of different groups, all reading the Bible, are arriving at the same conclusion. And that is exactly what 1 John chapter, one, chapter 2, verses 26 and 27, is saying, that we all have this anointing, and it teaches us all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And so we need to listen to that. And when you're reading a book and you find that they're denying fundamental truth about the nature of God. Now, and by the way, um, we hold the word of God firmly. I believe in the Holy Trinity. I believe it firmly. But if you ask me to explain it, or I know there's verses I would look to in which I can demonstrate to you from the Bible why Christians hold to the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But actually, I've got a lot of questions about these things. I wonder about it. It's amazing. And, and it's something that you ponder. And yeah. so I hold it firmly, but I hold it humbly. Yeah. And I think that is exactly the way it is with many of the doctrines of Scripture. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I claim to know have an answer to every question, but it, at the same time, does say that the Spirit of God is able to speak to me in such a way, so convincingly, that as I discover things as a new Christian, God, by His Holy Spirit, confirms to me that those that teaching is true and right. Yeah. And so, when I'm reading a book, and they're not lining up with fundamental doctrine, I know that the writer is blind. He's, 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 uh, he's, he's not giving me the truth. You know, that would be the most basic thing. So, and, and so, when we have writers that are playing to the latest political fads or, and sociological fads and things which are current in our society, and, and they're not able to affirm basic things. Uh, so, you know, and we could go on about different current issues, social issues. That's where you usually find it, where you'll right. have, you'll be reading a book and it, you realize, well, this person, he doesn't know whether he's a male or a female. And that's how confused these people are. Well, I... Uh, 
Yeah, it's interesting. I was reading a response. Uh, someone asked C.S. Lewis if he would prefer to read new books or old books. Yeah. And he said, well, if I could, I'd read future books. He says each generation corrects the mistakes of the previous generation. So he says that would be the ideal. He says, but that's, of course, impossible. He says, but <laughs> as a result, he'd like to read old books because very often we get stuck in like a generational bubble. And, and, and by reading older books, it allows us to escape and to see what were things they were struggling with, things that yeah. could be our blind spots uh, today. And so I, I, I thought that was quite interesting as well. A lot of the books you were recommending uh, were older books and sometimes people are put off by that and, and they like the, new, the newer books, right? The things that are just yeah. coming out. And, and so I found that very helpful for myself too, to have that as a perspective, looking at yeah. older books uh, in a way to eliminate blind spots for myself uh, being of this generation. So do you yeah. have some, um, if, if there are some folks out there who don't have um, Christians, godly Christians who know books, they may, they, they may have some folks and they go and say, what books do you read? And may, maybe those uh, people aren't reading good books. So would you have some good, you've given us a few good recommendations. Do you have a few more uh, recommendations for folks if, if they're eager, they're excited, um, they want to get uh, familiar with a few? You mentioned a couple authors. Do you have uh, one or two more recommendations that you say can't go wrong with this book? <laughs> Uh, I, I really enjoyed David Gooding's books. Uh, we, we were re recently looking at his book on the unshakable kingdom about the book of Hebrews. He has a great book on the book of Acts called True to the Faith. David Gooding is a wonderful Bible teacher. And, and he's one of these guys who wants you to think in scripture. So one of the things which uh, a friend of ours, uh, your dad knew him very well, and, and I knew him, Peter Pell, he was a Bible teacher, and he told me, he said, get acquainted with an author. So if you, if you find an author is really helpful to you, then get all of his books and read them. And, and I did that with different writers. Sometimes especially with the older writers. Now, David Gooden is a contemporary. Well, actually, he's passed on. He's with the Lord, but he doesn't write in an old style. He's very readable. He's writing in our generation. But, uh, and his books are available through Myrtlefield Trust. You can find it online. And other publishers and book distributors make him available. Gospel Folio Press has a lot of his stuff. And, and uh, these these books, which get you thinking in the scriptures, so that it, you, as you read them, it helps you in your own personal study from time to time. Now, if I didn't have any, uh, any recommendations on books at all, one thing I would do is just get a real good selection of Bible translations. That is a really big help. And when I when I'm looking at a passage, I'll read the passage in one translation, and then I might go back to the old, uh, the old uh, American uh, standard, with, which was in 1901, the precursor to the New American Standard translation. I might also read the New American Standard translation, or I might go back and read Darby's translation. Would, did that come out in 1881 or 1882? And then you'd you might read the revised version, 1881, and then you'd you might read the the uh, uh, NIV uh, or the ESV. These different translations, and and some of them uh, will well almost all of these translations will approach their translation it, with a certain kind of methodology, like some of them purposefully want readability and they some of them are very caught up with what they believe is 
the most accurate way, although it doesn't make for smooth reading, but it's yeah. in their view, more word for giving more of a word for word equivalence from the original language to the English. But when you read these translations, what happens is you find out, oh, there's a question here in this chapter about the rendering of how this, this word should be understood. Or, or uh, uh, this, this translation says it very differently. And so when I come upon that, then I would, on that very verse, look it up in a commentary. And I, I, uh, and I would always recommend to people get something like Bill McDonald's Believer's Bible Commentary. It's a one volume Bible commentary. It's not a technical uh, commentary. It's a bit folksy at times, but sometimes he'll, he'll touch on technical points. And there's a lot of practical things in there and it's trustworthy. You're not going to go too far wrong there. And then another one I like is Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. I think they were Presbyterians. They wrote back in the 1800s, but they're, it's very evangelical and, and uh, very orthodox and, and a real clear confidence in the Word of God. So I like Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown and often refer to it. And, and they're, they'll tend to make reference to things that are going on in the original language. Mm. That's very helpful. But, I, you know, I've got a large library, so I've got a bunch of things that I would use, but those are available. And you can get both of the Believer's Bible Commentary and Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown online easily. Most Bible, most uh, online Bible study things, you can get those. I think Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown is in the public domain. Okay. Likely, yeah, it'd have to be. Yeah. yeah. So, did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I think a uh, very helpful look. I think books, uh, especially when you have to pay, you know, so much for for books, and and yeah. not just one book or two books, but if you're hoping to start a library, you know, to be able to evaluate a book, and I like I liked your point about getting to know an author, sharing uh, yeah. Brother Pell's point, where you you find this one this one was really good what else was written by him and and being able to broaden uh your scope there yeah we we did uh, an episode with josh fitzhugh on myrtlefield and talked through some of his books so oh. i'm glad i'm glad uh, that came back up uh yeah. so really with the last point here for this episode as we wrap up is not just uh our books um, very helpful. But one thing I've been really enjoying are podcasts uh, and, and listening to other podcasts. And uh, you and your son, John Mark, uh, have been sharing a podcast called The Faith, yeah. and I have really been enjoying it. Uh, could you give us just a quick thumbnail sketch about uh, the things you cover in The Faith? Uh, years back, I was working with your dad. I worked with your dad for uh, quite a space. We, I think, started working together remotely in 85, and uh, he moved to Grand Rapids, and, and we teamed up together and worked on a magazine called Uplook Magazine, and I contributed an article called Heroes, and I, I was surprised when I looked at the list of how many of those heroes articles I ended up writing over the <laughs> next decade or better, but there's a bunch of them. And, and in those heroes articles, uh, we talk about great men and women of God, oftentimes largely unknown, but people that we thought the believers need to be acquainted with and, and that were a real encouragement. So people have often referenced to me or talked to me about those articles that I wrote, and sometimes I'll run upon a biography about somebody I had written about and find out that my information when I wrote my article was quite incomplete. So I, 
<laughs> so I, I, I feel like all my articles need to be gone over and worked over and probably rewritten, but uh, they're floating out there. Sometimes my articles, I, I found they're without any attribution. They're out there somewhere in the web and nobody, and nobody is saying who wrote it or where it came from, so, oh, yeah. which is odd to me. So I, uh, I, I, I think I should somehow commandeer them. But my son, he, he liked the articles and he approached me and said, let's, let, let's talk about some of these historical events. One of the things I always wanted to do was string together my articles and put them into a kind of a book. And one topic would have been the revival times in the 1800s, which were very instructive, very much I had a huge influence on the evangelical movement in North America going into the 1900s and, and something which people owe it to themselves to learn about. So there was a lot of people I wrote about who were instrumental or active in those times. And, uh, and so uh, I, I would talk, for instance, about revival, or I might talk about a particular man. I talked about Anthony Norris Groves, who was a tremendous man of God, who had a huge influence on a lot of people, like George Mueller. He's a brother-in-law to George Mueller and, and influenced George Mueller greatly and also influenced Hudson Taylor and others. And uh, so Anthony Norris Groves, a, a real amazing man of God and missionary and a practical man, so a sacrificial man. And, and these kind of people, it's so delightful to me. I, I, I'm, I, I'll never get over my shock once when I went to a bookstore, I was looking for some articles about Frederick Bedeker, who was a uh, great missionary to Russia back in the Tsarist times during its period of persecution in Russia. And and, uh, and so I came into this bookstore, this large bookstore, and they had shelves of books about Russia and a lot of historical stuff about the times of the czars and the times uh, around the Russian Revolution and so on. And so I started combing through these books, looking as I would in the index and and in the bibliography to see if there was any reference to Frederick Bedeker or Lord Radstock or the evangelical work that went on in Russia back in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. I looked and looked and there was not a word about Lord Radstock, Frederick Bedeker, or the, the, the men and women of God who sacrificed so much, gave up so much. Oh, but there was a lot of information and whole books written about people like Rasputin. What does that tell you? You know, people, they're totally absorbed with the most wicked, the most evil. I mean, Rasputin is probably demon-possessed. And so people want to read about that. They want to think about that. But they have no time for those who are true men and women of God who know God and walk with God. It goes back well, to your what's that? back to your list in Philippians, you know, that Absolutely. thinks on these things. Absolutely. And that's what we need to encourage the Christians to do. Find these people and and swim in that kind of an atmosphere. I mean this whole world is totally absorbing themselves with what is prurient and what is defiling, and it's, it's, it's really sad. It's truly sad. I'm no different. I mean, am I tempted by all that stuff? Do I want to spend my time reading or watching movies and watching documentaries or, or crime shows and things to, so I can learn and, and get into the mind of some serial killer? Well, my ambition needs to be get, to get into the mind of Christ, mm -hmm. right? To think yep. his thoughts, to understand why he thinks the way he thinks. It's not a help to me to get into the mind of an Adolf Hitler or a Rasputin or a Joseph Stalin as if that's going to make me wiser. 
it doesn't make me wiser. It makes me more deceived. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. And what, what really makes for wisdom is knowing what is truly good and right and true and just and honest. And that's what, it, what's what, that's what happens when we get to know God, right? Yeah. Yep. We talk about knowing God. When you know God, you know what is good and right and true and holy. Yeah. And I think a, a lot of the things that we mentioned with, or that you mentioned with books, applies the same to podcasts, you know, spending, people will spend hours and hours listening to podcasts. And again, li when I listen to The Faith, your podcast, you're constantly bringing out the scriptures, uh, pointing us back to, even though it, you're talking about, you know, uh, the 1800s or, you know, with, you know, life in Burma, constantly bringing oh, it back, constantly bringing us back to the scriptures uh, and, and making the history uh, or showing the, the scriptural context to it, right? This is, this is what the scripture looks like when it's lived out uh, in these people's lives and, and checking, you know, uh, where you'll talk about this person and then check them against the scripture. And, and show us how scripture gives parameters to life as well. Um, and so I, I found that very helpful. Um, and so hopefully I'll, I'll put a link in the description so people who uh, listen and can, uh, you know, we only come out with one per week. So if, if they're waiting for the next one, they can jump over and listen to yours. I, I, <laughs> I, I'm almost all caught up. I, I was actually listening to uh, Anthony Norris Groves on the way over here to <laughs> shoot this. So interesting. Yeah. Well, if that's true, and if you're blessed, I'm very happy. Well, good, good. Thanks again for joining us on Enjoy the Book of Life. Uh, we hope that you've benefited from this, that you can take these recommendations, find yourself some good books, and that uh, the evaluation process discussed uh, will help you as you construct your own Christian library.